So if we could have our first panel make their way down. Thank you very much. So there's a theme to these panels today. Um, there's three of them, and the, it's, they respectively talk about doing data science at early stage companies, uh, hyper growth companies, and then large later stage companies. Because these things are probably somewhat different, am I right? Um, by the way, these panels are intended to be interactive. Uh, we've got a, a nice small room here, so uh, feel free to raise your hand, shout out questions if you'd like to participate. So you should think of you, all of us as, uh, as on the panel. So I'd like to reintroduce um, our panelists today. I've got my notes here. Uh, Ian, again, is a recovering physicist. He has spent most of his subsequent career in healthcare data science. He's worked across m many stages of the company lifecycle, from getting an operation off the ground and wrangling the infrastructure to trying to grow mature product lines. As a data science lead at Clover Health, he designed and built many of the initial data systems. Diane Tang, uh, Diane is a data scientist at Stellar, a startup building a digital infrastructure for money, and her work runs the gamut from designing the data infrastructure to analyzing behavior to discover fraud. Before that, she was a data scientist at Twitter and studied mathematics with computer science at MIT. Both of them have been there and done that for early stage companies and doing data science there. And the panel will be moderated by Juliet Hoagland, a senior data scientist from, from Cloudera. Take it away. Good morning. Thank you for waking up and kicking off the day with us. We're going to talk about doing data science at early stage startups. Uh, my background before I got to Cloudera was being the fifth engineer at a platform machine learning company built on Hadoop and then the first engineer at an applications company. And so I'm particularly excited to interview uh, Dee Yang and Ian about how data science is different when you're at such an early stage startup. Uh, and so my first question is how you got to the point where you decided you're going to join a crazy venture like an early stage startup. So what was your career trajectory? What made you sort of get to that point where you're like, yeah, this is, this is what's for me? Uh, so I knew I always wanted to be a statistician. Like I find statistics like philosophically important. It's like how, it's like how, we, how we find truth. It's like epistemology, basically. Um, so, uh, you know, I wanted to do statistics. Like data science seemed like, you know, the best, like, uh, application of such in the real quote unquote real world. Uh, and when I was a data scientist at Twitter, I really learned a lot and I got to use a lot of tools made by people who were like way better at engineering and thinking through systems than me. Uh, so I wanted to like pick up those skills um, and I wanted to like be put in like a environment where like I couldn't do anything but learn new stuff. So like that's why I decided to join like, you know, a 10-person company where I was the only data scientist? Um, yeah, so for me, it was really like when I finished grad school, I was trying to figure out what would I like to do with myself, and the academic world didn't really work for me. Uh, and a big part of why it didn't work was I felt like I was just making the, this like small incremental progress on problems that were already relatively well-defined. Um, and uh, as I started to explore what was out there in the commercial world, it just turns out that like big companies look a lot like that too. Um, and I, I personally just do really well in areas where the problem space is super ambiguous. <laughs> um, and uh, so like early stage really, really spoke to me. And it, it, if I like watch my career, I've been like moving earlier and earlier. <laughs> sort of as I, uh, kind of as I go along. So my impression of your two answers is that you both wanted the deep end, <laughs> wanted to dive right in. That's yeah, wonderful. I'm a, I'm a big fan of like learning to swim by getting in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So I guess my next question is, what do you do as a data scientist now, and how does data and data science fit into the companies that you work at? So some background on the companies that you work at would be pretty helpful. That's a very, very vague question. Um, so background on Stellar, uh, so company, uh, so banks talk to each other using the protocol ACH um, in America, American Clearinghouse. Basically, when you go to the Bank of America and you give them $200, they issue you 200 Bank of America USD on ACH. 
And every country has a different like, you know, banking protocol, and internationally there's SWIFT. So basically Stellar is trying to make like, the one protocol to rule them all that's like, open and decentralized and you know, modern. Uh, so in the, how does data work with that? How does data science fit into the organization? What does data science do inside of Stellar? I mean, you are data science inside of Stellar, right? <laughs> but like, if you were to describe the overarching data science goals that yeah. you contribute uh, to. I think the overarching goals is like discover fraud. Uh, we're doing this thing where like, to, you know, to really to kick off uh, the network is giving away like the you know the native digital currency. So like discovering fraud, figuring out how people are using the network like beyond fraud, and trying to encourage that type of behavior. Uh, so like you know, and then like because I'm the only one doing it, like building all the infrastructure, so I can just like be like, okay, let's look at you know these people and how they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So uh, Clover Health for those of you that don't know, is a uh, health insurance company. Uh, so we uh, basically take on members and pay for their health care. Um, uh, as, as, as an insurance company, we, uh, like the core of our product is data. Um, that's how we know things about our members. Uh, that's how we kind of figure out what the next set of actions we, we have to take is. Um, basically, uh, uh, data fits into uh, uh, our uh, kind of our, our, our core structure in two places. Uh, one uh, is that uh, we, uh, so like the job of an insurance company is, is to take on risk, uh, and our model is actually to find ways to modify risk. Uh, and, so, uh, and so we spend a lot of time structuring and digging through data so that we can find the places where, where, where we can take actions that will risk modify. Uh, and the second piece uh, is really we, uh, uh, most people don't like their insurance companies. Most providers don't like working with insurance companies. Uh, we're really looking to change that. Uh, and so uh, we do a set of, of essentially uh, like product, uh, uh, like, uh, sort of product-focused uh, things as well, uh, so that we can get to a place where we understand how to how to uh, make our products loved. Um, for uh, so for me, uh, I've now kind of run run the gamut uh, in in terms of. Uh, in terms of what I do there, uh, most of the work up, up to this point has really been about like structuring the data so that uh, we can use it in all sorts of places and surface it in our data products, uh, especially out at, at the point of contact with the member or the provider. So I think that brings us to an interesting point. It's <laughs> something that's somewhat distinguishing about doing data science at early stage startups, which is the day-to-day -day acts of what you do in data science, I mean, it's almost always different from what people assume data scientists do, right? Like, people assume you're just kind of like fitting a model and that's the hard work. Um, at, at Clever Health and at Stellar, what are your day-to-day -day tasks? What is your, what is like a normal day look like for you? And, yeah. Um, sure, so uh, basically, I, at least at this point, like, I, I'm not spending a lot of time fitting fitting models. Uh, like, we do have models that operate out in, like, out in the real world doing things. Uh, some time is spent maintaining those, those models. And then every now and again, like, tasks come up where it's like, oh, this would be really valuable. We need to build a new model here. But that's not a day-to-day -day activity. That's a project. Uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, is really more about, like, uh, building uh, building stability and maintainability into our systems. So structuring and restructuring data, uh, 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 digging into all the various edge cases that our test suite and whatnot are, uh, or, or, our, uh, or our users are catching, uh, and using that as an opportunity to kind of like every day make our system a little bit better. Mm -hmm. I think at Stellar, my work hasn't really stabilized into a day-to-day, -day, so I can talk about like the phases in which I've done. Um, so in the beginning, it was like you know, kind of like what you did with like structuring data, like figuring out 
what there is, what we can get. Like, there are obviously privacy concerns then, like, when it comes to money, like, you know, like, that's, that's a big thing. Uh, so, like, the first, you know, first month or so I was there, like, really exploratory. Like, what do we have right now? What will work? What will not work? And then, like, deciding, okay, I want all of this data. How do I store it? How do I, like, you know, learning all that data engineering stuff and setting up the infrastructure. Uh, and then the next phase is really like, you know, like defining, once you have some data to look at, like defining like what your metrics for good is, like what, what is fraudulent, what is not fraudulent, what is like, you know, in terms of describing behavior, now that we have the data to look at the behavior. Um, it's, it's really iterative because it's kind of, you know, a little bit like the exploratory, but like explore, exploration, building the stuff you need, exploration, and then like, you know, building again, like, you know, the models that we need uh, the, uh, you know, like design, like, you know, thinking about designing features that will, like, invite and encourage, like, the correct users. Um, and honestly, it's, like, it's still really chaotic. Like, for the last few months, I've been working on uh, JavaScript client libraries. So, you know, I've been, been, doing a lot, been doing a lot of that, building the SDK, and, yeah, like, writing docs for parts of the system I haven't even worked on. So, like, you know, at the startup, you just, you just do what there needs to be done. Um, so I have plenty more questions for the panelists, but I'd really love to get audience questions going. I think we have some really awesome experts up here, and I'm sure you have questions for them. So let's prepare for that by having me ask you a question. Who has a right hand? I think more. Who has a right hand? <laughs> Who has a left hand? Great. Who has a question? Great. How often do you change? Thank you. How often do you change the infrastructure? So you're working on new products, and, uh, but that probably has an impact on the frameworks that you've picked, hardware, or infrastructure. How often do you go back and you say, hey, we need to change this again? So I think your, your question assumes a lot like more infrastructure and more experienced infrastructure than like we do. Like, um, so an interesting thing with Stellar ha is happening is that like we have had to like relaunch our network because there was a distributed system fork, which I was like, wow, this is great. Like I get a mulligan, I get to redesign like you know the stuff I did before. But honestly, it's like it's really lightweight. Um, I remember a struggle I had was that I had to like you know build like data pipelines to like continuously read the data and put into the databases, and I was like. I don't know how to do this. At Twitter, I think they use Storm. Like at, at LinkedIn, they use Kafka, right? So let me let me go look at what those things are. And I was like, these are these are too powerful. Like needs too much configuration for what I'm doing. So I just wrote like Python scripts, like you know, like you know, hundred line like Python scripts to uh, do all that. So like if when the second infrastructure change comes, it's going to be really easy to. Um, to like you know export the data like it's in Redshift right now like you know it's all backed up in S3 like you know text files it would be really easy to put that in something new and like there's not there's, I haven't you know accumulated that much like like technical assets where I wouldn't cry like I wouldn't cry if like we had to like you know just uh, destroy them all like it would be better like I'd be like oh we can actually use a system that was meant to like you know deal with large amounts of data other than just like me like piddly piddly like you know like let's just write a python script that like you know runs in the background in cron so yeah i i can't even count how many uh, iterations we've gone through at this point um and, and it comes down to the same thing like uh we've we've taken the approach of like do the dumb thing first um and that's because, like, that it, it's really it's really hard to define to like it, it, if you build out uh, pure infrastructure, uh, it locks you into a view of the world, uh, and it is really really hard to have a good view of the world when like you have no idea what the problem space looks like, um, and so we generally try to just like get ourselves going in whatever way possible. Uh, and then and then add in pieces of the infrastructure like on top of that and ride that until the whole thing collapses in on itself uh, and and then try to take a better approach uh, we we've generally tried to like uh, get a handle on when things might collapse in on themselves and get to it early <laughs> Uh, but in an early stage, it's also there's like you're doing 20 things at once, 
And so like the fact that the pipeline isn't as fast as you want it to be is just generally not problem number one on the list. <laughs> But yeah, no, uh, none of us would cry if like a bunch of engineers came in, you know, came in tomorrow and said, hey, here's a brand new pipeline. It's going to be awesome. It does all of these things that like you guys have been doing manually for the last six months. <laughs> It'd be like, great, <laughs> we'll do our shit in that now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I, I mean, w we've tried to be very uh, deliberate about, about these, these kinds of decisions. Wait, so, oh, it's fine, it's fine, go, 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 great. So, so both of you have, have, have had backgrounds where you've been in the more sort of sustaining part of working with data where, you know, particularly say at Twitter, where um, there are wonderful things you can do with what you have, but you've also now experienced sort of life during cold start. And I'm curious, what does the ramp feel like in the early days versus when you can get to a point where you can really iterate on what you've learned? Sorry, what does is, what is the what feel so like? What is, life during cold start, like you're basically a lot of what you're doing now, you've had to do from scratch, which is, I think is particularly a challenge for data scientists. I'm curious what the perspectives have been. Um, yeah, so uh, it's a struggle. <laughs> like there, there's just no way around that. So basically like, uh, uh, essentially the, the way that I sort of think about it is, is there's this cycle that you go through where like first you're struggling with not enough data, and then you're struggling with, you know, then you, f you figure out a way to find enough data, see your network, whatever it is. Uh, then you struggle with the infrastructure for like getting something out of that data. You build out a set of infrastructure, you're getting something out of that data, but you've also, if you've built your business right, you're getting a feedback loop at this point, or you have the makings of a feedback loop. So the data starts to grow, and then you start to realize the limits of, of like the thing that you've built. Uh, and so like, you know, at that point, you're, you know, you're really in the infrastructure fight. So you fight that for a little while, uh, and then you cap out the gains. And you're basically like, OK, like now everything is saturated. I can't move the business forward unless I have more data. So you go back to the data struggle. <laughs> Uh, maybe you instrument a few things. Maybe you like you know try to push a new product line or or or, or something of that nature. Uh, you solve that problem. The data starts starts growing again, and then you you're right back in the infrastructure fight. And and it's sort of the this loop. Uh, to me, the difference b between like early stage and late stage is that in early stage those loops are really 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 fast that like literally in the same day you can be moving from one to the other. Uh, and uh, and on, on top of which like you have this extra problem that like you're just given this charge of like figure out a way to get us value from this. Uh, and in th the company probably doesn't even know how it's going to make money yet in like a lot of cases. Uh, and so like it, you need to make the infrastructure do something at the same time that you're sort of fighting with, like, how do I get it to do anything? <laughs> um, and uh, so that that's that's been my experience. That's also where I have the most fun. So I have a lot of thoughts about this cold start, um, and that's because like one of the most um, disorienting things about starting a new like a early stage startup is that there's no ground truth. Um, so one thing I had to do was like, you know, try to figure out uh, what's a good user, what's a fraudulent user. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm, I built all these like ego networks. I like, you know, did like analysis, like, you know, a little aggression on like those graph properties. And it's like, oh, wait, like, you know, you know, just because they're fraudulent doesn't mean they're necessarily a bad user. Like there are all these product definitions that we hadn't come up with. And basically like I had like a series of one-on-ones with my, uh, with the CTO where like at the end I was like, do you want me to pull numbers out of my ass? And he's like, yes, basically. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was like this, oh my God, I don't, I don't know how to handle like this little, I went a little, you know, like the, the circuits kind of went like, what? Like, 
Because as a data scientist, you, you like to be correct. Like, you know, at Twitter, if I were wrong, that would be not good. That would be like, OK, yeah, like this A-B test, like obviously the A is the right thing to do. Or like, oh, looking at like, you know, photos on tweets, like, nah, we shouldn't, we shouldn't do that. Like, that's not a good idea. Like, you want to be, like, statistics teaches you, A, you should be like relentlessly skeptical of like, you know, anecdotes, of intuition, of like, you know, deciding things on your own. Uh, and as like a data scientist, you want to like be precise and you want to be correct. And like, I guess this is kind of like the data loop. Like before you understand what the data is, you're, you, you're going to have to like try and it's like you're, you know, you're, you're blind and you're in a room and there are a lot of soft things and you're just like kind of, kind of going out and reaching for them, and touching for them. So yeah, I just, I like, it's, you, <laughs> you like, you really don't have a ground truth and that, that was like something I, like it took me a little bit to, like to adjust, like wrap my head around basically. So like you know, uh, and like at Twitter there was a ground truth like you want to improve MAU, you want to improve revenue. Like we know there's like enough data that we know like you know these type of things happen and you can work within those frameworks. Um, but like you know something as simple as like defining what is a good user was extraordinarily difficult at Stellar. Uh, this gentleman and then Michelle. Uh, thanks. Fascinating answers there. So I'm going to take it the next step, which is that is part of your job to communicate your, <clears throat> your revelation to business users, and if so, how do you do that in ways that idiots like me can understand? Um, so that's an emphatic yes. <laughs> uh, things that people can't understand are just not really that useful. Uh, and, and especially for us, like we don't just have business users, we have, uh, we have clinical users who have expect, who, who like don't have the same uh, relationship to numbers that even finance people do, uh, but they, they do have a really strong relationship to uh, clinical information. Uh, and so like tr trust in our data products, trust in our, in our uh, reporting is really, really important um, and that was actually like as, as we kind of got started that that was one of the first things that we tackled like how do we push out insight to this set of other people um, and it, it, it is not an easy problem uh, you ha uh, uh, like we found we had to tackle it from like multiple ends uh, a, uh, a and essentially what it came down to for us was was number one uh, like building a personal connection to the user base, uh, so actually talking to them, uh, because when they knew that there was a human being who was actually producing this stuff and that they could have trust in who that person was, that they were competent and they were ethical and that they, were, they had the same goals, like already that, that makes the conversation uh, uh, a lot easier. Uh, once we had that, we then moved on towards like, uh, we needed to give people a direct portal into the data so that it wasn't just like emails that we were sending them or you know whatever messaging posts. Um, so uh, that obviously was challenging for us because of uh, HIPAA concerns. <laughs> um, and so like finding like the types of tools that normal that like regular SaaS companies can use like just weren't open to us. Uh, eventually we uh, we uh, uh, we pushed the mode guys into uh, building out HIPAA compliance into their platform, uh, which gave us a seamless way to just uh, share business insights uh, with our, like, with kind of the more, the more technical set, uh, or pseudo-technical set. Um, and, I mean, we've basically used that to great effect, like just uh, personal relationships and, and a collaboration platform. So at Stellar, there's less like, you know, talking like clients and partners as Ian's having at uh, Clover Health. So like, I ha yeah, like I do have to communicate like, you know, my technical like results to um, like, you know, non-technical like stakeholders. Um, oh, so thank you, closer to my mouth. Um, so like, I've had to do that and it's, it's something I've had to do at Twitter, it's something that I have to do at Stellar, it's something that I'm gonna have to do like all the time and I think 
I think like the, the lessons I've learned from that uh, when giving presentations is like to really focus on the narrative. Um, like 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 people like CEOs do not really care about like you know how great your like you know your ROC is. Like you know they don't they don't really care that much about your p value other than it's it's significant or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's something uh, I've learned because I think uh, most of the time I do communicate with other technical people, like, okay, like, you know, like, this is what it looks like, this is going on, uh, and you have to really, like, modulate what you're going to say uh, depending on how technical they are and, like, just, like, their level of interest in the, the nitty-gritty details. Michelle. Yeah, I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you choose which problems to tackle. There are so many squirrels to chase. How do you narrow that focus in order to provide as much value as you can to a company at such a vulnerable stage? Um, yeah, so, so that really comes down to a relentless focus on business value. Um, and, and like, you know, basically at, uh, oh, uh, uh, bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I probably should have said that earlier. <laughs> um, so, uh, like when it when it comes down to it, like most companies are really only going to make money in a couple of different ways. Uh, and if if you are like if you are not relentlessly focused in the early stage at figuring out what those ways are, you're going to fail. Uh, and so, really, what that means is uh, uh, is uh, you, you, you need to, to like take whatever assets you have uh, and start to build on them uh, in a way that, that, like, uh, that generates information for you. Uh, so you know, basically, you're going to take the data, uh, create a set of core hypotheses that like maybe there's opportunity here and here and here and here. Uh, push out a, uh, 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 a set of like really immature products that that like tests whether you can make money <laughs> in those in those places. Uh, very quickly cut whatever is not producing money, uh, and then taking the information that you get from the ones that like do look plausible and and kind of build the next set. Um, there, like, uh, unfortunately, like that's like what hypothesis or what hypotheses you test is not a data-driven problem. Right, so like the data is not going to tell you like what is the right product for this for this market space. Like that is an intuition problem, uh, and you basically need to get to know your domain really, really well, and like understand like okay, here is what people are doing here, uh, here is what people are trying to do here, and here is what is actually hard about all of the things that they're that they're trying to do. And then like your, your job as the data scientist is to translate all of that into things that you can actually measure if you had some new stuff to kind of push in there. Um, and so like that's, you know, so, so, so for us, it was, you know, it was really about, all right, we need to aggregate all of this data. We need to figure out like what's actually driving cost in our system, what's actually driving value in our system, and, and where the gaps are in terms of like where we could try to insert things to generate more value and generate less cost. Uh, and there's nothing in the data that will necessarily tell you how to do that, uh, but uh, but by understanding like the goals of this of the system as a whole, you can come up with a set of hypotheses and then a measurement machine to like go to go get it basically. So at Stellar, Stellar is a nonprofit, so like we have like it's we don't really have like a metric of like revenue or business. It's like a measure of like traction and how well we're like queuing to our mandate. So. Uh, I actually found that, like, you know, and I have like little nonprofit experience and little like you know making a protocol the standard of the web, like n no experience with that. So uh, I really relied on you know like the like you know the, the executive director and the pro project managers, um, and I found that like um, the like you know a problem with data science is that you can like go in infinitely deep, right? Like the data is there, you can go in and delve, like you know, oh let me try something new, let me. Like you know, uh, go and and think about these people like more. Um, and I do think like pipelining uh, is an issue, where like you know you just have to oh, like personal project pipelining, not data pipelining. Um, 
And I think that's something like really just like watch out for the, to not really like get too deep and be like, okay, what can I answer the question with uh, in a way that makes you know that like answers the question, makes everybody happy, and like being able to move on uh, or basically like have that in the back burner until like you know more information arises or like my priorities shift a bit. So, so we have. Two minutes, 50 seconds left, and I want to stick into the time, but I have one more question that I think you all can answer in like 30 seconds, even though it's going to be very hard. And that is, how, what advice would you give to someone who's a data scientist at larger companies now, and they're interested in preparing to be a data scientist in an early stage startup? What, what, what advice? I, I, I have advice. So. Um, so when you're when you're in like kindergarten, they like they teach you like you know it's like stop, drop, and roll. Like you know, you repeat it all the time. You're like duh. Like when I'm on fire, I should stop, drop, and roll. Or like look look both ways before you you um, before you uh, cross the road. Or like don't shake your baby. Um, that's because that, like that's because when like you know you're on fire or you're about to cross the road or like you you have a you know really annoying baby. Like you want to panic. Look with you know cross without looking or shake the baby like they tell you like all these things like you know don't like repeat this to yourself when you're on fire you should stop drop and roll um, and one thing that I feel like I've had to do is like I I know I know at a startup you want you know you want to move fast you want to be scrappy you want to do an MVP but like you, my instincts were still like you know go for correctness like you know be a good data scientist go for correctness always like you know be questioning like you know uh, deeper and deeper. So like I started like chanting MVP, MVP, MVP to myself, um, like and MVP. like yeah, yeah, yeah. MVP. Like when I'm like when I'm doing something like I'm kind of unhappy about it. Like I'm just you know and like even when my coworkers are doing something they're unhappy about, like you know they're like oh, you know the dev portal. I'm not happy with it, but it's done. I started like you know kind of chanting. I, I don't think they, I told them, but like I started like chanting at them like MVP, like MVP, <laughs> like you know like like we might not be perfectly happy, but like we will. We, we will go keep on going. So like, yeah, just have like you know have a have a chant like that because your instincts your instincts will be to be correct and your instincts will be like you know to to do what's like you know precise and right and like you need to not do that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna echo that a little bit. Uh, um, uh, to me, what it what it comes down to is like you know people think of like building building startups as like oh you're like you're like looking for for like diamonds and piles of coal, and really building a startup is like you're you're looking for a diamond that is buried in a giant pile of shit, um, and so like you need to be wanting to shovel shit. <laughs> Um, wow. So, it, like, like that's where the value is because, like, nobody wants to be shoveling shit. So, like, you have to be in there shoveling shit. Um, so, uh, if if you're thinking about like wanting to go into early stage, uh, the thing that I would say, if if you're a big company person and you're used to structured environments, is just go and do a few things that you really, really suck at. Uh, like if you're, you know, basically like if you don't spend a lot of time at the gym, like that would be a good way, like go to the gym, do some exercises that you're terrible at that like make you feel terrible <laughs> and like, and like just get used to the struggle because that essentially builds the muscle of like doing things that are really, really, really hard. <laughs> awesome. That's great advice. Well, thank you for our panelists.